Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sahana Sakirtan and today we're going to be talking about endocrine disorders. So I'm going to be covering pituitary disorders, adrenal disorders, diabetes and then finally thyroid disorders. So first, a quick recap of the pituitary gland. So the endocrine gland is found in the cell aterica in the middle cranial fossa. It's anatomically and functionally closely related to the hypothalamus. So there's two parts to the pituitary gland. We have the, we have the anterior pituitary gland, which is also known as the adenohypophysis. Um, this releases ACTH, TSH, LH, FH, GH, MSH and prolactin, whilst the posterior pituitary gland, i.e. the neurohypophysis, releases ADH and oxytocin. So the main functions of the pituitary gland are to regulate metabolism, growth, sexual maturation and reproduction, blood pressure, breastfeeding, immune response. And the three types of pituitary cells are the acetophilic cells, which secrete prolactin and GH, basophilic cells, which secrete ACTH, TSH, LH and FSH, and finally chromophobe cells. Okay, so hyperpituitarism is the damage to the pituitary gland or hypothalamus, and this leads to a decrease in secretion of the anterior pituitary hormones. So uh, panhyperpituitarism is deficiency of all the anterior hormones, and these may also include the posterior pituitary hormones, often caused by surgery, a pituitary tumour or irradiation. So the causes occur at three levels. We have at the level of the hypothalamus. So this may be due to tumours, inflammation, infection, such as meningitis or tuberculosis, ischemia or Kalman syndrome. So Kalman syndrome is a rare genetic condition where there is a decrease in the gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, produced from the hypothalamus and this leads to a delayed or absent puberty. Uh, the second level is at the pituitary stalk. So this might be due to trauma, surgery, meningiomas, um, carotid artery aneurysms, or even mass lesions such as craniopharyngiomas. So craniopharyngiomas, they originate from the Ratke pouch and they're found between the pituitary gland and the third ventricle floor. So the, it's the most common childhood intracranial tumour. And in childhood, we can see it as growth failure or in adults, it's going to be amenorrhea, decreased libido, hypothalamic uh, signs such as diabetes insipidus, hyperphagia, sleep disturbances. And this can be diagnosed via CT or MRI because calcifications can be seen. At the next level, so the pituitary gland, again, it can be caused by tumours, inflammation, irradiation, autoimmunity or ischemia such as uh, DIC, Sheehan syndrome. Um, or pituitary apoplexy. So Sheehan syndrome is postpartum hemorrhage, therefore postpartum necrosis of the pituitary gland. So during pregnancy, there's hypertrophy of the prolactin producing region, and this becomes ischemic. So if there's blood loss during delivery, this is going to lead to hypovolemia, and that will in turn lead to vasospasm of the hypophysial vessels leading to ischemia. And so we can see empty cell aturica on imaging. It often presents as gonadal um, failure with inability to lactate, as well as TSH deficiency and ACTH deficiency. Over time, the necrosis is going to be, uh, is going to be replaced by fibrous tissue and shrunken glands. Pituitary apoplexy is the infarction of the pituitary gland uh, due to ischemia or hemorrhage, and it mainly affects the anterior pituitary gland since the blood supply comes from a lower pressure arterial system. So there's an increased chance of ischemia or infarction. Um, so the pathophysiology, so a decreased growth hormone can lead to growth retardation and a decreased bone density. Decreased prolactin leads to inability to lactate after delivery. Decreased FSH or LH leads to secondary hypogonadism. Uh, decreased TSH leads to secondary hypothyroidism. And decreased ACTH leads to secondary adrenal insufficiency. As we discussed previously, panhyperpituitarism can include uh, posterior pituitary hormones as well. So if there's a decrease in ADH, there's going to be 
uh, central di uh, diabetes insipidus and also a decrease in oxytocin. So the signs and symptoms uh, in hyperpituitarism. So we have intracellular or paracellular masses. So these include our pituitary microadenomas. So we may, uh, the patient may experience headaches or visual field defects such as um, bitemporal hemianopsia. So we know hemianopsia is loss of vision on one half of the visual field. So if it's uh, hominous, it's going to be on the same side. Uh, whereas heteronymous, its same visual fields of both eyes are affected. So temporal fields of both eyes are going to be affected, perhaps due to optic chiasm damage. Uh, pituitary apoplexy will present as severe headaches, bilateral hemianopia, um, diplopia due to damage to the oculomotor nerve, and also sudden hypertension, which can lead to shock. Decreased growth hormone can be seen as a short stature, central obesity, atherosclerosis, dry, wrinkly skin, uh, as well as a decreased strength, balance and well-being, uh, exercisability, cardiac output and glucose, as well as osteoporosis. And finally, a decrease in prolactin is going to lead to an absent lactation. So a decrease in FSH or LH is going to lead to a decrease in fertility and libido, osteoporosis, breast atrophy, abnormal menses and dyspareunia. So this is pain during sexual intercourse. A decrease in TSH is going to lead to an increase in weight, cold intolerance, uh, constipation, fatigue and dry skin. And a decrease in ACTH is going to lead to decreased weight, weakness, hypertension, chronic hyponatremia and hypoglycemia. In the posterior part of the pituitary gland, if there's a decrease in ADH, that's going to lead to central diabetes insipidus and therefore we're going to get polydipsia and polyuria. So for the diagnosis, uh, we look at the basal levels. So we measure the concentration of the anterior pituitary hormones and the target organ hormones. We look at dynamic pituitary hormone testing um, so we can assess adrenal insufficiency. And we also look at post pituitary function. So we look at serum sodium, osmolality, uh, urine osmolality and the 24 hour urinary volume, as well as uh, doing a water deprivation test, which can be used for the diagnosis of diabetes insipidus. The treatment, we need to manage the underlying um, etiology. We also can do hormone replacement. So, for example, glucocorticoid replacement can be with prednisone or hydrocortisone. We can do growth hormone replacement, um, TH replacement with levothyroxine and even gonadotropin replacement, so with estrogen, testosterone or progesterone. Okay, so hyperpituitarism, um, so for example adenomas, they produce GH, ACTH and prolactin. So TSH and gonadotropin releasing hormone adenomas are rare and some adenomas don't even produce any hormone, so they're non-functional. So instead they compress the pituitary gland and that would lead to hyperpituitarism. So we can classify uh, this according to size. So if it's micro, it's going to be less than 10 millimetres and if it's macro, it's going to be greater than 10 millimetres. Somatotropic adenomas are associated with acromegaly, so often it's an excess of growth hormone in um, adults, as well as gigantism. So this is excess growth hormone before the epiphysis closes. It's made of granulated, strongly eosinophilic cells, and this causes an eosinophilic adenoma to form. Prolactinomas are the most common type of pituitary tumours. So uh, clinical features include hypogonadism and galacteria, and a microadenoma is made of sparse, granulated, acidophilic or chromophobic cells. Corticotroph tumours are present, uh, they present as Cushing syndrome, and they're usually basophilic microadenomas. Pituitary tumours account for 10% of intracranial tumours, so there's three histo uh, histological types. We have the chromophobe, which is mostly non-secretory and can cause hyperpituitarism. Half of them produce prolactin and a few produce ACTH or GH and cause a local pressure effect in about 30% of patients.
Um, the next type is acidophil, so they secrete prolactin or GH, and the local pressure effect occurs in 10%, and basophils, which secrete ACTH, so symptoms are caused by pressure or hormones such as galacteria occurring. Um, so the symptoms uh, include headaches, vi uh, visual defects such as compression of the optic chiasm, which will cause a bilateral temporal hemianopia, Palsy of cranial nerve 3, 4 and 6 due to pressure or invasion of the cavernous sinus, diabetes insipidus, sleep disturbances, appetite disturbances and erosion through the floor of the cella turica, which would lead to, a C which would lead to CSF rhinorrhea. So diagnosis, it can be visualised on MRI, screening tests, um, even glucose tolerance test if acromegaly is suspected or the water deprivation test if DI is suspected. The treatment is hormone replacement, radiotherapy for recurrent uh, adenomas and surgery. Um, so usually it's transphenoidal unless there's a supracellar extension and in this case we would use a transfrontal approach. So for prolactinoma uh, the first line treatment would be a dopamine agonist and preoperatively would use hydrocortisone, um, about 100 milligrams either through IV or IM, and subsequent cortisol replacement and reassessment varies with local protocols. So it's important for the patients to get advice. Post-op, we need to retest the pituitary function um, and assess any replacement needs and repeating dynamic tests for adrenal functions uh, at least more than six weeks uh, post-operatively. Hyperprolactinemia is present in females, uh, so example is abnormal menses, uh, or in males, so erectile dysfunction and or mass effects. So an increased prolactin will inhibit the gonadotropin releasing hormone to be secreted, and this is going to lead to a decrease in LH, FSH and testosterone. So that's going to lead to infertility, osteoporosis, lactation and hypogonadism. So the etiology is excess production from the pituitary gland, so like a prolactinoma, disinhibition via compression of the pituitary stalk, and this will lead to a decrease in dopamine, use of a dopamine antagonist. Physiologically, it can be due to pregnancy, press, breastfeeding, stress, or even drugs such as alpha-methyldopa, uh, haloperidol, or metoclopramide. The symptoms and signs include amenorrhea, infertility, galacteria and decreased libido. Diagnosis is through um, checking the basal prolactin, uh, doing thyroid function tests, or use and ease and MRI. The treatment would be dopamine agonists such as cabergoline or bromcryptine. Acromegaly is excess growth hormone secondary to a pituitary adenoma ectopic growth hormone uh, releasing hormone or growth hormone production by tumours. Symptoms are coarse facial appearance, so a wide nose, spade-like hands, so increased growth of jaw and feet, large tongue, excess sweating, uh, features of a pituitary tumour such as headaches, bitemporal hemianopia and hyperpituitism, and prognathism. So prognathism is the positional relationship of the mandible or maxilla to the skeletal ba base. So either of these uh, jaws protrudes beyond a predetermined imaginary line in the coronal plane of the skull. Complications include an impaired glucose tolerance, uh, vascular complications such as increased uh, blood pressure, cardiomyopathies, or left ventricular hypertrophy and neoplasia, so increased risk of colon cancer. Diagnosis is through MRI of the pituitary fossa, um, increased glucose, calcium and phosphates, and the treatment is transphenoidal surgery, correction of the growth hormone or IGF-1 hypersecretion via somatostatin analogues and radiotherapy, and a growth hormone uh, antagonist if the somatostatin analogue doesn't work.
Diabetes insipidus is characterized by the decreased secretion of ADH from the pituitary gland, and this can either be cranial DI or an insensitivity to ADH, and that will lead to a nephrogenic DI. So causes of cranial DI are idiopathic, post-head trauma, pituitary surgery, craniopharyngiomas, histocytosis, hemochromatosis, or congenital causes, DID mode. So DID mode stands for diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, optic atrophy, and deafness, which is also known as Wolfram's syndrome. Causes of nephrogenic DI uh, can be inherited causes, metabolic, such as low potassium and high calcium, uh, lithium, so this desensitizes the kidney's ability to respond to ADH in the collecting ducts, um, and even tubular interstitial disease, so obstruction or sickle cells or pyelonephritis. So common features are polyuria and dilute urine, nocturia, so this is daytime sleepiness and restless sleep, and severe dehydration, so uh, this would lead to an altered mental status, um, seizures, lethargy and coma. The diagnosis is through use and ease, calcium glucose in order to exclude diabetes mellitus, serum and urine osmolality. So a significant DI can be excluded if the urine to plasma osmolality is greater than two is to one. The water deprivation test is used to differentiate between primary polydipsia and DI. So the patient needs to stop drinking water for two to three hours. And after they've been without water for two to three hours, you need to test the urine volume and the osmolality every hour, as well as the sodium and plasma osmolality every two hours. So if the urine osmolality has increased and has reached a normal level, we can exclude DI. If there's no change in the urine osmolality or plasma osmolality, we need to give desmopressin. Um, so if there's a patient response to desmopressin, this can also indicate um, diabetes insipidus. Um, and we can differentiate between cranial and nephrogenic DI. So in cranial, the urine osmolality is going to rise after desmopressin administration. So that shows that renal ADH is intact. Whereas in nephrogenic, the urine osmolality is still going to remain low after desmopressin administration. So that will show a defective renal ADH receptors. Uh, finally, we can also do CT or MRI, and that can be used to exclude brain tumours, so craniopharyngiomas, for example. Treatment, so for nephrogenic, uh, we can use diuretics like thiocides. Advise the patient to have a low salt and protein diet and to discontinue the causative agents such as lithium or uh, demicocycline. For cranial DI, we can give uh, chlorpropamide or desmopressin. So now we're going to uh, discuss about adrenal disorders. So a quick recap about the adrenal glands. So there are paired retroperitoneal organs found on the upper poles of each kidney. They're made up of two layers, the adrenal cortex, which is the outer layer, and this produces steroid hormones. And it's made up of three parts, GFR, so zona glomerulosa, uh, which synthesizes mineral corticoids. So this is, um, responsible for regulating renal sodium, water reabsorption and potassium excretion. Zona fasciculata is for the synthesis of glucocorticoids, so it's responsible for glucose metabolism, and zona reticularis, which is synthesis of androgens, so precursors of estrogen and testosterone. The, uh, the adrenal medulla sorry, uh, is the inner layer and produces catechoamines and is made up of chromaffin cells. So they're going to secrete norepinephrine, dopamine and epinephrine. The arterial blood supply is from the superior, middle and inferior suprarenal arteries and the venous drainage, so the right suprarenal vein drains into the inferior vena cava whilst the left suprarenal vein drains into the left renal vein. Cushing syndrome, aka hypercortisolism, is caused by an excess administration of exogenous glucocorticoids. 
So it's a loss of the normal feedback mechanisms of the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis and the loss of the circadian rhythm of cortisol secretion. So the etiology can be according to location or according to ACTH. So according to location, we have exogenous causes. So chronic glucocorticoid therapy would lead to hypercortisolism, and that would decrease the ACTH, leading to a bilateral adrenal atrophy. Endogenous causes are primary hypercortisolism. So this is ACTH independent uh, Cushing syndrome. So it's autonomous uh, overproduction of cortisol by the adrenal gland. That's going to lead to ACTH suppression and leading to atrophy of the contralateral adrenal gland. So this might be due to adrenal adenomas, adrenal carcinomas, or macronodular adrenal hyperplasia. Secondary hypercortisolism is due to pituitary ACTH production, aka Cushing's disease. Um, so a pituitary adenoma is going to secrete the ACTH and that's going to lead to a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. And um, we can also have secondary hypercortisolism due to ectopic ACTH production. Um, but if we look at the etiology according to ACTH, we can divide it into dependent and independent causes. So for dependent causes, we have Cushing's disease, ectopic ACTH production and ectopic CRF production in the thyroid and uh, prostate cancers. And for ACTH independent causes, um, so this is decreased ACTH due to, an, due to a negative feedback mechanism, uh, adrenal adenomas or cancers, uh, iatrogenic causes such as steroids and carney complex. So carney complex is a genetic syndrome um, uh, characterized by multiple benign tumors that affect the heart, skin and endocrine system. So we're going to see perioral pigmentation, cardiac myxomas, schwannomas, endocrine tumors of the adrenals and the pituitary gland. Symptoms of Cushing syndrome include an increase in weight, mood change such as irritability, psychosis, depression, proximal weakness, gonadal dysfunction, so irregular menses, hirsutism, erectile dysfunction, acne, um, virilization in males, and recurrent Achilles tendon rupture. Signs include a moon face, central obesity, buffalo neck hump, supraclavicular fat distribution, skin and muscle atrophy, and purple abdominal striae. So the diagnosis, so lab findings, we can see hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, metabolic alkalosis, hyperglycemia, and hyperlipidemia. In hypercortisolism screening, we're gonna see an increase in 24 hour urine cortisol, um, increased early morning serum cortisol um, and this is after the low dose dexamethasone suppression test and an increase in midnight salivary and serum cortisol. So the treatment is iatrogenic so stop the medications. If it's ectopic ACTH surgery uh, we can also give some medications such as ketoconazole or fluconazole which decreases the cortisol secretion preoperatively and for adrenal adenomas or carcinomas, we can do an adrenalectomy. So this cures the adenoma, but rarely uh, cures the cancer. So in addition, we can do radiotherapy and adrenolytic drugs, such as mitotain. So Addison's disease, also known as adrenal insufficiency, is the failure of the adrenal glands to produce enough adrenocortical hormones. So there's three types. We have primary, which is Addison's disease. Then we have secondary and tertiary. So for primary, we have the abrupt onset of the adrenal, sorry, abrupt destruction of the adrenal gland. So this might be through a massive adrenal hemorrhage. So it might be due to meningococcal sepsis, which will cause an endotoxic shock, and that would lead to hemorrhagic necrosis. Um, so waterhouse Friderichsen syndrome or DIC. A slow destruction of the adrenal gland or atrophy due to autoimmune conditions such as autoimmune adrenalitis or infectious adrenalitis can lead to a chronic adrenal insufficiency. Secondary causes include sudden discontinuation 
of glucocorticoid therapy or stress. So this can be due to infection, trauma or surgery, conditions that decrease ACTH production, uh, hyperpituitarism, or even prolonged iatrogenic suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Finally, we have tertiary. So these are conditions that decrease CRH. So it's often due to sudden cessation of chronic glucocorticoid therapy. So hypothalamic dysfunction leads to decrease in CRH. That's going to lead to a decrease in ACTH, and that's going to lead to a decrease in cortisol release. And this can occur due to hemorrhage, anorexia, trauma, or a mass. So symptoms include hypoaldosteronism features, so hypertension, salt craving, um, lab findings will be hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, and this occurs in primary adrenal insufficiency. We can also see features of hypercortisolism, so weight loss, anorexia, fatigue and lethargy, which leads to depression, uh, GI features such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, orthostatic hypertension, and lab findings include hypoglycemia or hyponatremia, and it occurs in primary, secondary, and tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Uh, next, we have hypoandrogenism, so loss of libido, loss of axillary and pubic hair. This will lead to a decrease in DHEA, and this occurs in primary, secondary, and tertiary adrenal insufficiency. And finally, we have increase in ACTH, so hyperpigmentation in areas that are not exposed to sunlight, such as palmar creases or mucous membrane of the oral cavity. Um, this can lead to an increase in MSH and occurs in primary adrenal insufficiency. So the diagnosis, as we discussed previously, hyponatremia or hyperkalemia is due to a decrease in mineral corticoids. Um, hypoglycemia is due to a decrease in cortisol, uremia, eosinophilia, anemia, and hypercalcemia. The treatment is usually to give glucocorticoids or a mineral corticoid replacement therapy. Patients uh, should take hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone, and hydrocortisone needs to be given in two or three divided doses, and the patient needs to take 20 to 30 milligrams per day of hydrocortisone. It's important to educate the patient uh, so not to miss any glucocorticoid doses, to consider you know, medic alert bracelets or steroid cards, and to give the patient a hydrocortisone injection with needles and syringes in case of an adrenal crisis. So hyperaldosteronism. So we have primary hyperaldosteronism, which is excess production of aldosterone, which is independent of the RAS uh, system. So this is going to lead to an increase in sodium water retention and a decrease in renin release. It's caused by autonomous excess production of aldosterone in the zone of glomerulosa in one or both adrenal glands. So it's often due to bilateral idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia or it's due to aldosterone producing adrenal adenomas, aka um, Kahn syndrome. So the pathophysiology, an increase in aldosterone is going to lead to an increase in the opening of sodium channels at the cortical collecting ducts of the kidneys. This is going to lead to an increase in sodium reabsorption and retention, leading to water retention and therefore hypertension. Aldosterone escape is the evading sodium retaining effects of inappropriate elevated aldosterone levels in conditions such as primary hyperaldosteronism or congestive heart failure. The sodium and water retention is going to lead to an expansion of volume and this is going to lead to secretion of ANP and pressure naturesis. So this will lead to compensated diuresis and escape from edema formation and hyponatremia. So the symptoms uh, are hypertension, hyperkalemia, so we're going to see muscle weakness and cramping, headaches, palpitations, fatigue. Um, we're going to see metabolic alkalosis, which occurs via two mechanisms, both of which decrease the extracellular hydrogen ions, thereby increasing extracellular pH. So we're going to have an efflux of potassium from the intracellular to the extracellular space in exchange for the hydrogen and an increased hydrogen secretion in the kidney in order to enable the potassium to be reabsorbed. Um, we're also going to get absence of a significant edema due to this aldosterone escape that we discussed previously and paresthesia.
The diagnosis is plasma aldosterone to renin ratio. This is the first line investigation. So if there's an increase in plasma aldosterone. This will indicate um, hyperaldosteronism. We can also do a high resolu resolution CT abdomen, which will differentiate between unilateral and bilateral sources of excess aldosterone. And we can also do adrenal vein sampling. So if the CT appears normal, by doing an adrenal venous sampling, this can distinguish between a unilateral adenoma and a bilateral hyperplasia. So secondary uh, hyperaldosteronism is due to a decrease in renal perfusion, and that's going to lead to a high renin. So this is caused by renal artery stenosis, um, accelerated hypertension, diuretics, hepatic failure or congestive heart failure. So Barter syndrome is a major cause of congenital salt wasting via the sodium and chloride leak in the loop of Henle via a defective channel. So in childhood, we're going to see polyuria, failure to thrive, polydipsia and a normal blood pressure. And when we have sodium loss, that's going to lead to the volume depletion, so an increase in renin and aldosterone. As a result, this is going to lead to hyperkalemia, metabolic alkalosis, increased urinary potassium and chlorides. And the treatment for this is um, potassium replacements, providing ACE inhibitors and uh, NSAIDs in order to inhibit prostaglandins. So pheochromocytoma is a rare catechoamine secreting tumour. So it's 10% familial, and it might be associated with men type 2, which we'll be discussing later, neurofibromatosis, von Hippolindo syndrome. It's bilateral in 10% of cases, malignant in 10% of cases, and extra adrenal in 10% of cases. So the most common site is the organ of Zucker candle, which is next to the aortic bifurcation. The symptoms include hypertension, headaches, palpitations, sweating, and anxiety. And the diagnosis is a 24-hour urinary collection of the metanephrines, um, as well as doing an abdominal CT or MRI to find any extra adrenal tumors. The treatment for this will be surgery, alpha blockers preoperatively, and beta blockers such as propanolol. So next we're gonna cover hirsutism, virilism, gynecomastasia and impotence. So hirsutism is male pattern hair growth in women. So it can be familial, idiopathic, um, increased androgen secretion. So this can be via the ovaries, so ovarian cancer or PCOS. It can be through the adrenal glands, so late onset uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Cushing syndrome or adrenal cancer, or even drugs such as steroids. The diagnosis uh, on ultrasound, we can see a bilateral polycystic ovaries, and we can also do a full blood count, and we can see increased testosterone, decreased sex hormone binding globulin, and an increase in the LH to FSH ratio, TSH, and lipids. The treatment is weight loss if the patient is overweight, cosmetic techniques such as waxing or bleaching, combined oral contraceptive pills such as um, cociprandiol, um, I think it's also known as Dianet, um, or we can do uh, ethanol estradiol. And for facial hirsutism, we can do a topical eflornithine, but it's contraindicated during pregnancy or breastfeeding. Okay, so virilism is the onset of amenorrhea, a deep voice, temporal hair recession and hirsutism, and we need to look for an androgen secreting adrenal or ovarian tumour. Gynecomastasia is increased oestrogen and it's due to hypogonadism, liver cirrhosis, hypothyroidism, tumours, which will lead to estrogen producing, so this might be testicular or adrenal, or even HCG producing tumours, so testicular or bronchial tumours, and drugs such as spironolactone, estrogen or digoxin. Um, we have erectile dysfunction as well, so inability to attain and maintain an erection. It is a symptom, it's not a disease, and the causes can be 
organic or psychogenic. So organic causes include a gradual onset of symptoms, normal libido and a lack of um, tumescence. So this is the normal engorgement with blood, i.e. vascular congestion of the erectile tissues, marking sexual excitation and possible readiness for sexual activity. Um, psychogenic causes of erectile dysfunction include a sudden onset of symptoms, decreased libido, good quality spontaneous or self-stimulated erections, major life events, uh, problems or changes in a relationship, previous psychological problems or a history of premature ejaculation. So the risk factors include drugs such as beta blockers or SSRIs, alcohol and CBD risk factors, so obesity, uh, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking and metabolic syndrome. Drugs, so in males, it's important that the CVD risk is calculated every 10 years. And also free testosterone needs to be measured in the morning uh, between say 9 to 11 a.m. So if the free testosterone is low or borderline, you need to repeat and also measure the prolactin, FSH and LH levels. If it's abnormal results, it's important to refer the patient to endocrinology. The treatment is PDE5 inhibitors, such as sildenafil or vacuum erection devices if the patient cannot take PDE5 inhibitors. Okay, so the third topic we're going to be covering is diabetes. Okay, so diabetes mellitus, the definition is a lack or a decrease in effectiveness of endogenous insulin. So metabolic derangement, such as hypoglycemia, will lead to microvascular complications, such as retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. And macrovascular uh, complications include stroke, renal vascular disease, or limb ischemia. So the diagnosis of diabetes, according to the WHO, is symptoms of hypoglycemia, such as polyuria, polydipsia, unexplained weight loss, visual blurring, genital thrush, and lethargy an increase in venous glucose on two separate occasions. So this can be fasting glucose greater than seven millimoles per litre or random uh, glucose test, which is greater than 11.1 millimoles per litre or the oral glucose tolerance test, which is again greater than 11.1 millimoles per litre. In addition, we can measure the HbA1c, so if it's greater than 48 millimoles per litre, this could also indicate diabetes. Um, so it's important to manage diabetes because untreated type 1 diabetes can lead to death. Poorly treated can lead to significant morbidity and mortality due to diabetic ketoacidosis. So the aim is to try and reduce the incidence of these micro and macrovascular complications. Okay, so the type of uh, diabetes, so we have type one. Um, so this is adolescent onset, but may occur at any age. So autoimmune disorders where insulin producing beta cells of islets of Langhans are destroyed by the immune system. So it causes an absolute deficiency of insulin, which, re which results in an increase in glucose levels. So patients tend to develop uh, type one in childhood or early uh, adult life and typically present unwell. Uh, and this is possibly in diabetic ketoacidosis. Type 2 is the most common cause of diabetes mellitus in the developing world. So it's the most, it's caused by a relative deficiency of insulin due to an excess of adipose tissue. So if there's not enough insulin to circulate, circulate around all this excess fatty tissue. That's going to lead to an increase in blood glucose. We also have pre-diabetes. So this is a patient who has not yet met the criteria for type 2 diabetes, but is more likely to develop it in the future. So it's important for lifestyle changes to occur and close monitoring of this patient. Gestational diabetes, so this is when a pregnant female uh, may develop an increase in glucose levels during pregnancy. So if untreated, this can lead to adverse effects for both the mother and the baby. And another type of diabetes is uh, 
maturity onset diabetes of the young. So this is a group of um, inherited genetic disorders that affects the production of insulin. So young patients will develop uh, symptoms similar to type 2 diabetes, so for example asymptomatic hyperglycemia, and that can progress to severe complications such as diabetic ketoacidosis. Late autoimmune diabetes of adults, so this is um, majority of patients with autoimmune related diabetes, so often presents later in life and is misdiagnosed usually as type 2 diabetes. Other types include uh, pathology, so damage to the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans due to chemochromatosis or chronic pancreatitis. Drugs such as glucocorticoids can increase blood glucose. Um, we can have congenital lipodystrophy or glycogen storage diseases and even Cushing's disease, uh, so like acromegaly, pheochromocytoma, hyperthyroidism can all contribute to diabetes. The symptoms of type 1 diabetes is weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia, diabetic ketoacidosis. So we're going to have abdominal pain, vomiting and a decreased level of consciousness. And in type 2, it's going to be polydipsia, polyuria, and it's often observed during a routine blood test. The diagnosis, we can do different tests, so the finger prick bedside glucose monitor, the on-off blood glucose, which can either be fasting or non-fasting, HbA1c, it measures the amount of glycosylated hemoglobin and shows the average blood glucose over the past two to three months, and a glucose tolerance test. Treatment, lifestyle changes, for example, stop smoking, um, start statins, controlling blood pressure, giving appropriate foot care, pre-pregnancy care, so this can be done in a multidisciplinary clinic, advice um, on informing the driving license authority and not to drive in a hyper, in hyper, hypoglycemic episodes, and negotiate and target the HbA1c. So specific treatments for type 1 diabetes, uh, monitor HbA1c every three to six months, um, target to have a HbA1c less than 48 millimoles, Per mole, and self-monitor the blood glucose at least four times a day. Uh, insulin, so you can have self-adjust doses of insulin depending on exercise, calorie intake, um, subcutaneous insulin, uh, such as short or medium or long acting, and depending on strength as well. And you can even give metformin if BMI is greater than 25 kilograms per meter squared. Um, for type 2 diabetes, again, it's important to have a HbA1c target depending on what anti-diabetic drug the patient is on and diet advice. So for the anti-diabetic drugs for type 2 diabetes, so you can titrate up metformin and encourage lifestyle changes in order to bring the HbA1c to at least 48 or less. Um, and you should only add a second drug if the HbA1c continues to rise till 58 millimoles per mole. So if you have lifestyle changes, the HbA1c target is 48 millimoles. If you have lifestyle and metformin being administered, again, 48 millimoles. Any drug that may cause hypoglycemia, uh, such as sulfonylurea, the target is going to be 53 millimoles. And if the patient is already on treatment, but the HbA1c has risen to 58, the target is to bring it down to 53. Diet advice includes low fat dairy products, oily fish, um, high fibers, low glycemic index sources, control the intake of foods containing saturated fats, trans fatty acids, um, limited substitution of sucrose containing foods for other carbohydrates is allowable, but care needs to be taken to avoid excess energy intake. Okay, so complications of diabetes includes vascular disease. So myocardial infarction is four times more likely in a diabetic patient. Um, other vascular disorders are stroke. Um, so women are at more risk. Um, and so risk factors are diet, smoking and hypertension. So we can suggest a statin um, 
in order to reduce the chances. Fibrates are useful for triglycerides and HDL, and aspirin can also reduce the risk of vascular events happening. Nephropathy, so microalbuminuria, is when the urine dipstick is negative for protein, but the urine albumin to creatinine ratio is 3 milligrams per millimole. And this reflects early renal disease and vascular risk. So spironolactone can be used uh, in order to reduce the risk of nephropathy. Diabetic neuropathy is a decreased sensation, absent ankle jerks, neuropathic deformities such as pes cavus, claw toes, loss of transverse arch and rocker bottom sole. Sensory loss is patchy so it's important to examine all areas using a monofilament. Um, then we're going to move on to diabetic uh, retinopathies. So blindness is preventable, so it's important to do annual retinal screening and it's mandatory for all patients that are not already under ophthalmology care. Um, Presymptomatic pre screening enables um, enable, enables uh, laser photocoagulation to be used. Uh, and also we can do background retinopathy, so microaneurysms, uh, so they'll appear as dots or hemorrhages which appear as blots uh, and hard exudates can be seen. Uh, maculopathy, so this is hard to see in the early stages, but a prompt laser or intravitreal steroids or anti-angiogenic agents uh, may be needed for macular edema. Uh, okay, so for ischemia. If the foot pulses can't be felt, it's important to do a Doppler pressure, pressure measurement. Uh, educate the patient about daily foot inspection. So look in the mirror, check the sole of the foot, wear comfortable shoes. Uh, it's important to go to the chiropodist, so remove the callus since a hemorrhage and tissue necrosis can occur below the callus, which can lead to ulceration and also treatment of fungal infections. Also, it's important to look out for, for ulceration. Uh, because um, so they may appear as painless punched out ulcers in an area of thick colors and it causes cellulitis abscesses and or osteomyelitis the treatment is chiropody chiropody relieving the high pressure areas with bed rest and therapeutic shoes and intravenous antibiotics Hypoglycemia is when the plasma glucose is less than 3 millimoles per litre. So the physiological response is a hormonal response. So a decrease in insulin secretion is going to lead to an increase in glucagon secretion. So growth, ho growth hormone and cortisol are also released, but later. Then we have the sympathoadrenal response. So increase in catecholamine mediated and acetylcholine mediated neurotransmission in the peripheral autonomic nervous system and central nervous system. Fasting hypoglycemia can be through explain. So exogenous drugs such as insulin, oral hypoglycemics, aspirin poisoning, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, pituitary insufficiency, liver failure and inherited enzyme defects. Um, Addison's disease, islet cell tumours, and non-pancreatic neoplasms. Postprandial hypoglycemia occurs after gastric or bariatric surgery, or even uh, in type 2 diabetes mellitus. So the treatment is sugar supplements and long-acting starch, and yeah. The final topic we're going to be covering is thyroid disorders. Okay, so structure and function of the thyroid gland. So it's a bilobe structure found in the anterior neck and it's part of the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis. It has negative feedback cycles to maintain the normal circulating levels of triiodothyronine, i.e. T3, and thyroxine, i.e. T4. The arterial supply is the superior thyroid artery, which comes from the external carotid artery, and the inferior thyroid artery, which comes from the thyrocervical trunk. Physio physiology, so the hypothalamus secretes TRH and it produces um, TSH from the anterior pituitary gland. TSH increases production and release of T4, T3 from the thyroid gland. Therefore, negative feedback on TSH 
and regulation uh, in the use of energy sources, as well as regulation of protein synthesis and controlling the body sensitivity to other hormones. Most T3 and T4 is plasma protein bound, example thyroxine binding globulin, but the unbound portion is active. Uh, so important things to recognize is thyroid autoantibodies. So antithyroid peroxidase is seen in Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Graves' disease. TSH receptor antibodies is seen in Graves' disease and thyroglobulin antibody is seen in thyroid cancer, Graves' disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Sick euthyroid syndrome is when all the thyroid hormones are low. So in the majority of cases, the TSH might be within the normal range, um, but it might be inappropriately normal given the low thyroxine and triiodothyronine. So changes are reversible upon recovery from the systemic illness, so no treatment is usually needed. So thyrotoxicosis is the excess hormones due to gland hyperfunction. So this can be caused by Graves' disease. So this is circulating IgG autoantibodies that bind and activate the G protein coupled thyrotropin receptors, which causes smooth thyroid enlargement and hormone production, especially T3, and reacts with orbital autoantigens. So the, the triggers are stress, infection, childbirth, and patients are often hyperthyroid, but may uh, become hypo or euthyroid. It's also associated with other autoimmune diseases, such as type 1 diabetes, Addison's and vitiligo. Toxic multinodular goiter. So this is seen in the elderly and in iodine deficient areas. Um, so nodules that secrete thyroid hormones and surgery is indicated for compressive symptoms from the enlarged thyroid, such as dyspnea or dysphagia. Ectopic thyroid tissue is, for example, um, follicular thyroid cancer, ostruma ovary. So this is when an ovarian teratoma contains thyroid tissue. Toxic adenoma is a solitary nodule producing T3 and T4. So on an isotope scan, the nodule look hot, you can say, and the rest of the gland is often suppressed. Subacute uh, Subacute dequarian thyroiditis is a self-limiting post-viral uh, with painful goiter and exogenous causes such as iodine excess. So this might be seen in food contamination or contrast media um, and even levothyroxine excess will cause uh, increased T4, decreased T3 and decreased thyroglobulin. The signs of um, thyrotoxicosis are fast irregular pulse, warm moist skin, fine tremors, palmar erythema and signs of Graves disease such as exophthalmus, pretibial myxedema which is an edema to swelling above the lateral malleoli, thyroid acropachy which is clubbing, painful fingers and toe swelling and periosteal reaction in the limb bones. Other symptoms include diarrhea, decreased weight, increased appetite, sweating, heat intolerance, palpitations, tremor, irritability, oligomenorrhea, and infertility. The diagnosis is a decrease in TSH, whilst there's an increase in T4, T3, uh, ESR, calcium, and liver function tests. The treatment for this would be drugs such as beta blockers or antithyroid medications, thyroidectomy, or radioiodine. So thyroid eye disease affects 25 to 50% of patients with Graves' disease. So it's an autoimmune response against autoantigens, so the TSH receptor, and this leads to a retroorbital inflammation. So um, GAGs, collagen deposits in the muscles. So the prevention is to stop smoking and radioiodine treatment. Um, we, because radioiodine treatment increases the inflammatory symptoms in thyroid eye disease, um, we can give prednisolone, which should decrease the chances of inflammatory symptoms forming. Clinical features, the patient might be U, hypo or hyperthyroid at the time of presentation, exophthalmus, conjunctival edema, optic disc swelling, ophthalmoplasia and inability to close the eyelids. And this leads to sore, dry eyes. If severe and untreated, 
patients can be at risk of exposure keratopathy. The treatment is topical lubricants to prevent the corneal inflammation caused by this exposure, steroids, radiotherapy and surgery. So hypothyroidism, the ratio between females to males being affected is approximately 5 is to 1. So we have primary hypothyroidism, so this can be caused by iodine deficiencies, primary atrophic hypothyroidism, uh, post-thyroidectomy or radioiodine treatment, drug induced such as amiodarone, lithium, antithyroid drugs, subacute thyroiditis, so initially you'll have a hypothyroid phase and then a longer hypothyroidism. So another cause is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's the most common cause and it's an autoimmune disease associated with insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, Addison's disease or pernicious anemia. It may cause transient thyrotoxicosis in its acute phase and is five to ten times more common in women. Uh, the goiter can occur due to lymphocytic and plasma cell infiltration, but it's also common in females between 60 to 70 years, 70 years old. Um, and they, again, like I said, they might be hypothyroid or euthyroid, and sometimes initially they'll have a hypothyroid phase. Um, secondary hypothyroidism is due to hypopituitarism, and this is associated with celiac disease or Turner's or Down syndrome. Other associations include autoimmune conditions uh, such as type 1 diabetes, cystic fibrosis, primary biliary cirrhosis, and Poems syndrome. So Poems syndrome consists of polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, M-protein bands, and skin pigmentation or tethering. Sym symptoms of hypothyroidism um, include being tired, sleepy, lethargic, decreased mood, disliking the cold, increased weight, constipation, menorrhagia, hoarse um, voice, decreased memory, cognition, dementia, myalgia, cramps, and weakness. Signs can be remembered by the mnemonic bradycardic. So B for bradycardic, R is reflexes are slow, ataxia, dry, thin hair and skin, yawning, drowsy, coma, then C is for cold hands, A is for ascites, a round puffy face or double chin, defeated demeanor, immobile and or ileus, and congestive heart failure. Diagnosis is through the low threshold of TFTs, so increased TSH, decreased T4, as well as having increased cholesterol and triglycerides and macrocytosis. The treatment is initial dose of levothyroxine, but you need to remember to give a lower dose in elderly patients or those who have ischemic heart disease. And it's important to change the thyroid dose. So TFTs need to be monitored every 8 to 12 weeks. The target TSH level is between 0.5 to 2.5. And in pregnant females with hypothyroidism, it's important to increase the dose by 25 to 50 uh, micrograms. So the adverse effects of thyroxine therapy is hypothyroidism if there's excess treatment, reduced bone mineral density, worsening of angina and atrial fibrillation, and the interactions with levothyroxine are iron and calcium carbonate, which is why it's important to give at least four hours apart between these medications. So subclinical thyroid disease, we can have hypothyroidism. So this is when T4 and T3 are normal, but TSH is increased. Um, and this causes an increased risk of progressing to overt hypothyroidism and it's more common in males. So the treatment is um, if TSH is between 4 to 10, you know, and the free thyroxine is normal, um, you can give levothyroxine uh, for those under 65 years old. In patients that are greater than 80 years old, it's important to avoid hormonal treatment and try the watch and wait strategy, i.e. see if there is normalization of the TFTs. In asymptomatic people, observe and repeat the thyroid function test in six months. If TSH is um, greater than 10 and free thyroxine is normal, in patients less than 70 years old, start the treatment even if they're asymptomatic with levothyroxine. And again, in older patients so who are older than 80 years old, 
avoid hormonal treatment and try the weight and uh, the watch and weight strategy to see if there's normalization. Okay, so subclinical hypothyroidism is when there's decreased TSH but a normal T4 and T3. So it's important to check for non-thyroid causes like illness, pregnancy, pituitary and hypothalamic insufficiency, or TSH suppressing uh, medications such as uh, steroids or thyroxine. The treatment is um, to make sure to confirm if the suppressed TSH is persistent and check every two to four months. Uh, recheck every six months if it's asymptomatic and you can give carbamazole or even radio iodine therapy. So parathyroid gland and hormone. Uh, so the parathyroid gland is basically two small endocrine glands located posterior to the thyroid gland. They're found within the pretracheal uh, fascia and the arterial supply is the inferior and superior thyroid arteries and there's a rich anastomosis between these two vessels. The venous drainage uh, drains into the thyroid veins. The parathyroid hormone is secreted by chief cells of the parathyroid gland and it increases the serum calcium concentration via stimulation of parathyroid receptors in the kidney and the bone. The plasma half-life is approximately four minutes. The effects of the parathyroid hormone are so in the bone, it will bind to osteoblasts, therefore osteoclasts cause resorption of the, po of the bone, releasing calcium. Kidneys, um, they cause active reabsorption of calcium and magnesium from the distal convoluted tubule. There's going to be decreased phosphate reabsorption as well. In the intestines via the kidneys, there's going to be increased intestinal calcium absorption via activated vitamin D, and this is going to increase the calcium absorption. So hyperparathyroidism primary, so this is often seen in elderly females with an unquenchable thirst and a normal or increased parathyroid hormone. So the etiology is solitary adenomas, hyperplasia, multiple adenomas and carcinomas. The symptoms are bones, stones, abdominal groans and psychic moans. So we have polydipsia and polyuria. Uh, we're going to have peptic ulceration, constipation or pancreatitis, bone pain or fractures, renal stones, depression and hypertension. It's often associated with men type 1 and 2 and also hypertension. So the diagnosis is increased calcium and a low phosphate, normal or increased parathyroid hormone. And on x-ray, we can see a pepper pot skull. Um, the treatment is parathyroidectomy, conservative treatment, um, and this is indicated if calcium is below 0 0.25 millimoles per litre, above the upper limit of the normal range, as well as the patient being more than 50 years old, and if there's no evidence of end organ management. Uh, we can also give uh, calcium mimetic agents like sinacalcet. Um, in addition, it's important to advise a patient about fluid intake to prevent stones, avoid thiazides, and make sure to have a high calcium and vitamin D intake and see every six months. Excision of the adenoma um, of uh, or of all the four hyperplastic glands can help prevent these fractures and peptic ulcers. Um, and indications are when there's a high serum or urinary calcium, bone disease, osteoporosis, renal calculi, or renal function. Complications include hypoparathyroidism, recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, which will lead to the hoarse voice, and symptomatic calcium, so hungry bone syndrome, essentially. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is caused by a decrease in calcium and an increase in parathyroid hormone. So it's caused by chronic renal failure, which will lead to low calcium, and that's going to lead to parathyroid gland hyperplasia. Symptoms are bone disease, osteitis, fibrosis, cystica, and soft tissue calcification. And the treatment is surgery if bone pain or persistent protruitus or soft tissue calcifications. Correct the underlying causes, phosphate binders, vitamin D, and synthetic. Sinalset if parathyroid hormone is high.
tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So we're going to see increased calcium, parathyroid hormone, decreased uh, phosphates, normal or decreased vitamin D, and an increase in alkaline phosphatase. It occurs after prolonged secondary hyperparathyroidism. So the glands start to act autonomously, and that's going to lead to an uncontrolled feedback mechanism, increasing the parathyroid hormone secretion, therefore an increase in calcium. It's caused by hyperplasia of all four glands or um, in chronic renal failure. And the clinical features are metastatic calcification, bone pain and fracture, nephrolithiasis and pancreatitis. The treatment is allowing 12 months to elapse following a transplant, as many cases often resolve. Um, the presence of the autonomously functioning parathyroid gland might need surgery and you can either remove the affected gland or do a total parathyroidectomy and re-implantation re of part of the gland. Malignant hyperparathyroidism is when parathyroid-related protein is produced by some squamous cell lung cancers, breast and renal cell carcinomas. It mimics the parathyroid hormone, which is why there's an increase in calcium. So in primary hyperparathyroidism, there's going to be a decreased parathyroid secretion, which is often arising secondary to thyroid surgery. There's going to be decreased calcium and an increase in phosphates. And the symptoms are signs of hypocalcemia, such as tetany, perioral paresthesia, Trousseau sign, which is carpal spasm if the brachial artery is occluded by inflating the blood pressure cuff and maintaining pressure above systolic. Schwastex sign, which is tapping over the parotid, which causes facial muscles to twitch, um, as well as autoimmune comorbidities. The treatment for primary hyperparathyroidism is alpha sidol. For secondary hyperparathyroidism, it might be due to surgery from thyroidectomies or parathyroidectomies um, or hypermagnesemia. So magnesium is required for parathyroid hormone secretion. Pseudo hyperparathyroidism is failed target cell response to the parathyroid hormone. So you're going to get short metacarpals, round face, short stature and clarified basal ganglia. The diagnosis is a decrease in calcium and an increase in parathyroid hormone, and the treatment is the same as primary hypoparathyroidism. Pseudo-pseudo hyperparathyroidism is a similar phenotype to pseudo hypoparathyroidism, but it has a normal biochemistry. And finally, we come to MEN1 and 2. So this basically stands for multiple endocrine neoplasia. So in men type 1, there's three Ps. So men 1 gene is involved and it affects the parathyroid, the pituitary and the pancreas. So in the parathyroid, it might be due to an adenoma or hyperplasia. In the pituitary, it might be due to prolactinoma or GH secreting tumour. And in the pancreas, it's due to endocrine tumours such as gastrinomas or insulinomas. In men type 2A, there's two Ps involved. So the RET oncogene is involved and in the parathyroid, it might be due to hyperplasia. Um, thyroid gland might be affected due to medullary, th medullary thyroid carcinoma and pheochromocytoma, which is benign and bilateral. Uh, in men type 2b, there's one P. So RET oncogene is involved and pheochromocytoma. However, we might also get mucosal neuromas, which are made of bumps on the lips, cheeks, tongue, glottis, eyelids, and visible corneal nerves, as well as, as, well as um, a marfanoid appearance. So we're going to get the long spidery fingers, uh, which is known as arachnodactyly. Uh, the arm span is going to be greater than the height, pectus deformity, as well as joint hypermobility. Thank you for your attention. I hope this presentation has allowed you to gain a better understanding of endocrine disorders.